Welcome. I'm Lieutenant Domingo from the USF Police Department. Um, we do this program quite frequently. Uh, and basically it's how to deal with hostile customers and we'll talk a little bit about what to do, what to look for if someone's potentially going to become violent and some strategies that you can take and, and we'll, just, we'll just chat some too. So it's a little bit structured but feel free to ask questions uh, when they arise. Because um, dealing with customers is something we all do every day. We deal with customers all day. Uh, and many times our customers are not, you know, really happy to be dealing with us. Uh, and, that, and that can happen no, no matter what your, your function is here at the university, whether in an academic setting or physical plant setting, uh, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, there's the potential to uh, encounter people who are not having a very good day. Um, and just hopefully that doesn't co coincide when you're not having a very good day, because that makes it more challenging. So some of the areas that we see conflict or um, areas where people do be, tend to become irate on campus, and, and a lot of times people, particularly if they've never been in an environment of a campus, will say, well, it's, it's an area of enlightenment and wonder, and everyone's there for knowledge and wisdom and truth and all of those great things, and they are, but they're also human beings that bring all of the frustrations of their life here to campus and we just add a few more frustrations on them occasionally, uh, whether we intend to or not. Um, so these are some of the areas where we have seen um, a hostile customer situation actually become a little bit more uh, serious. Uh, it could be a, a student in financial aid that fails to receive their check, um, someone in student affairs that disciplines a student, um, parking and transportation, you think they have some, uh, some close encounters with hostile individuals? Yeah, they do, quite frequently. Um, but any of these areas, um, any place where you find human beings, there's the potential uh, for conflict and there's the potential that someone could, could approach you in a manner that is at, at, the, at the least disagreeable and at the most hostile in nature. So we want to talk about those things. Some simple things that we can do to try to set the environment. Uh, one of the things that I study in the crime prevention world is crime prevention through environmental design, which means the, using the built environment and designing the built environment to try to, to um, diminish uh, the chances that a crime will occur in that area. And we can do a lot in how we set up our different workspaces and work areas and areas of responsibility to try to reduce the potential for conflict or the potential for a hostile situation uh, to develop. Um, you know, if there's a particular area where, um, we all have different, different areas. There, there are public areas where anybody and everybody can come into. There are semi-private areas where we may occasionally escort people in and say come into this, this otherwise restricted area. And then there are areas where only the people who work there need to come in. We have all of those different layers at the police department and I'm sure that you do within your workspace as well. So we, we try to set up the design so that um, it's clear to people when they're making a transition and that there are established rules of how that transition takes place. You know, please wait to be escorted. You see it in restaurants all the time. There's one of, one of two signs usually, please seat yourself or please wait to be seated. And that's the restaurant giving you a cue that either we've got it covered no matter where you want to sit in the restaurant or we only have a certain number of servers right now. So if you go sit in an area where we're not expecting you to sit, nobody's gonna know to come and serve you. Okay, so we can, we can take that, that same mentality and try to think how in our work area, we can make it clear to people how they can best proceed to get services. Because sometimes it is unclear. Um, I, I dealt with, with one area on campus where people were coming back into the private area and they couldn't, they couldn't realize, they, they, didn't, they didn't understand why people just kept coming back because they had, they had a sign about this big up front that said, you know, please wait here. 
Well, then they lined up chairs into the private area. Well, from a psychological standpoint, when the customer approached, they didn't see the little, little sign that was here. They saw a row of chairs. Well, a row of chairs is an invitation. The people felt invited in. And once they're invited into that area to sit down, well, it must be okay to go and see the person that I wanted to see anyway. I'll just look for their door. So that was, an, it, and it caused conflict. And people to become upset when they were asked to, no, no, you need to go back and, and wait for someone there. Conflict was arising, and it was a miscommunication caused by the environment. So when they fixed that, it helped that problem. They got a nice, a bigger sign, a better sign, and moved those chairs to another area where they intended people to be able to wait until they were escorted back. So that, that helped. Um, and uh, you know, the, the last one there, there's something on, on the desk or the counter area that somebody can use. It's another way that we can look at our environment and if you sit down and look at just your work, your work area, what's, what is there that's available to someone that they can immediately get their hands on? And um, I've, I've been in areas where there were letter openers, nice, long, sharp letter openers, scissors, mm -hmm. paperweights, some nice big award somebody had been given. It was glass, big globe thing. All of those things are, are wonderful, and I'm t not telling you you have to sterilize your work area completely. And nothing, you can do nothing to personalize. No, that's not what I'm saying. But think about where things are. You, there's ways you can still display those items that you want to dis display the, uh, you know, the, the figurine or whatever it is, the decorative item that's up out of the way, and without giving somebody the opportunity to use something as a weapon. So we want to look at your area and say, how can I reorganize where I have things so that they're still available to me to complete my work, whether it's a letter opener, scissors, stapler, any of those things. Or it's still available decoratively, but it's not within arm's reach of someone who may try to do me harm. Um. If there's, if at any point, and, and this goes throughout, if at any point you're in doubt of whether someone is getting to the point where you can't conduct business because the person's being so disruptive and you're unable to diffuse that person, or you think somebody's, certainly if you think somebody's about to become violent, please do not hesitate to call us. We're here 24-7. That's what we get paid to, to respond to. We have options, as we, as we talked about earlier. We have a lot of options to, to, to deal with people. And, and quite frequently, our presence alone is enough to uh, start to de-escalate people. And that's one of the things that you want to you wanna emphasize is the ability to start de-escalating someone. Because when someone is already agitated, they're already upset, they're already frustrated. There's, there's a tendency to try to over talk them, shout over them, and be heard. Well, they're, they're already here. And when you go up here, guess where they're going to go? Okay, we're going to start climbing the ladder. And then somebody's going to go here, and then here, and then before you know it, it's, it's bad. So the more you can do to try to de-escalate things, try not to climb the ladder with them, try to uh, let them know that you are listening, um, this, it can be very difficult in an organi organization the size of USF. There's a lot of bureaucracy. Try as we might to, to make things easy for people, once you get outside of the easy path and something's not going right, it can be tough to get things straightened out. Um, and, and there can be, in some areas, that feeling of, I, they sent me here, and then those people sent me over here, and then they sent me over here. 
and by the time they get to you, they've had it. It's time to, and, and a lot of times when someone gets this way, what they're really looking for is somebody to just listen. Like any of us when we get frustrated. No, don't tell me I have to go to one more place. I, just somebody fix this for me. So a lot of times if you'll take the time to listen and, and let them talk without trying to, to over talk them, that'll help them. If you do talk to them, try to talk to them in a very monotone, very low. I'm talking right down here like this. If you want to hear me, you're going to have to quiet down a little bit to hear what I'm saying to you. I would like to help you. I'm sorry that you're, you're feeling very frustrated. I can tell that. Um, I've been there myself in the past and you know, we'd like to get this settled and we'd, I'd like to, to be able to identify the right person to send you to so that we can get the situation um, straightened out. And a lot of times if you've got that person who's, who has been sent from place to place to place and they feel like a ping pong ball, don't just send them to that next place where you think they can fix their problem. Pick up the phone and call and say, I have Mr. Jones here and this is his situation. Is your office the right one to help him? Who can I tell him to ask for that'll be w ready for him? Sometimes if you can do that, one, you've, you've helped solve their issue. Two, you've de-escalated them. And three, you've let them know that the university really does care. I mean, all of us are here in the final analysis to help the students to become successful graduates of the university and to have everything run smoothly. Sometimes when somebody's having a problem, though, it, it, it seems bigger than life. So sometimes you have to help them break down the problem into, into smaller bites. You ever heard the expression, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. It seems it's, it's huge. It's bigger than life. It sounds unsolvable. It's the great unsolvable problem because they've been trying to solve it and they can't. Sometimes if you can break that problem down into smaller bites for them, it'll help de-escalate them. It'll help bring them back down and you can get on with what you need to do, they can get their problem solved, and we can all go about our business. Because that's, that's the final, you know, our goal is to de-escalate the person, figure out what, it's, what, it's, what can be done about their situation, and get that, get that through. So we project calmness, we talk to them empathetically. You know, you can acknowledge the fact that I'm, I'm sure you're very frustrated by this. You know, I can, I can tell, you know, I've, I've been at USF more than 25 years. You can count the time I was here as a student. It's close to an unbelievable number. Um, but we've, we've all had different frustrations. And if you can bring those to mind and say, yeah, I, I, I've kind of been where you are. Let, let me help you. Let's fix this. Let's figure this out and let them know there is a person. Um, acknowledging their feelings. If, depending on the situation, you may want to have a place where you can remove them from the rest of the, of the business area. A place that they can go to where someone can talk to them individually. Everybody else can continue to do their work. Maybe have two people go and talk to them. If the person's really upset, it's not a bad idea to have two people go and, and sit down with the individual and talk to them. Uh, a room like this is a great place to take, to, to do that. You know, you've got two doors. One thing you don't want to be is in the room with someone who's really, really upset and to have them between you and the door. You want to try to arrange it so that you're the one close to the door. And if you can put them on the other side of the table, say you're back there and you're, you're seated in the back row and the other person is the next row over. Well now I've got to get across something to get to me and I'm closer to the door. And there's more than one of us here 
person is less likely to become physically violent if there's more than one person trying to help them. So all things you can, little things that you can do to, tr one, try to de-escalate them. Two, try to remove them from the larger area where they're causing more disturbance and more interruption. And th most importantly, keep yourself safe. Because in the final analysis, most important thing is that everybody's safe and nobody gets hurt. That's what we want. Try to, as I said, try to break down the problem to them. Try to, try to make it more manageable for them. That's, that's generally very helpful. Um, sometimes they might be right. You ever had anybody who was really upset with the way things were going and they had a point? It happens. We, you know, we're an organization of human beings and not all of our processes make the most sense sometimes. It happens. How do you figure out how to fix them? Well, the, the, the poor person that gets caught in that process that's not quite perfect yet can sometimes help you figure out how to solve it. And if you really think they have a point, you may not be the person who can fix that process, but there's nothing wrong with saying, you know, I, I think I understand how this happened, and I think I understand how our process could work a little bit better. And I'm not the person who can fix that, but I know who is. And I can take that to that person, and we're going to see if we can't fix that process. Because it, we're all evolving. You know, all of our processes evolve. We don't do things today the way we did 25 years ago when I first came to work here. The world changed. Technology changed. And sometimes our processes don't always keep up with that. And it's okay to say to someone, you know, I think you, you have a point about the way this process works. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see what I can do to, to move that concern along and, and maybe be part of the solution. You know, I'm sorry you had this problem, but I think it may help fix things down the road. And I'd like to use that to help fix things down the road. And that way you've given them, you've given them some um, ownership in the solution of their problem as well. Sometimes we get scared that we can't admit that maybe it's not perfect. And it's okay to say, yeah, you probably have a point. And I'm going to try to fix that for you. Um, these are some things to look at in terms of the hostile customer that may be on the point of really losing it and becoming physically violent, which is what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to solve their problem. We're also trying to get them calmed down so we don't arrive at this point. But you know there are some folks that no matter what you do, they're going to get here, right? Because of all the other things happening that you may have no idea about, are there people that are just not going to calm down? Yeah. There are people who are just not going to get calm for you. Nothing wrong with disengaging. Okay? You don't have to stay and, and deal with that person. If you really believe you're in danger, disengage and, and leave. And some of the things you want to look for is a change in their voice. You know, they came in, they were talking f normally, and suddenly there's, there's, a, there's a raspiness, there's a change in their voice. The intonation changes, it kind of sounds tense and raspy. Um, they may start repeating phrases. You know, I, this, this university is just so messed up. It is just so messed up. And they start just repeating things over and over again. Um, sweating for no apparent reason. Now, it's July. Okay. If somebody just walked here from the library, they're going to be sweating. That's fine. But if it's January and it's 30 degrees out and all, they're fine when they walk in and all of a sudden they start popping out with the globs of perspiration and they've got these other things going, it can be a sign. Okay. Uh, mouth breathing for no apparent, you know, they're, most of us in through the nose, out through the mouth, unless there's a little sinus thing going, okay, okay. 
But you get somebody who starts showing all of these things, they're, they're starting to get raspy, they're repeating things, they're repeating things, they're repeating things, they're sweating, they're, 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 they're clenching up, they start, you know, they do that thing like, you know, I could be a ventriloquist because I'm not moving my lips and I'm not opening my mouth like my mother when she gets mad, you know. She can say a whole sentence without unclenching her teeth, <laughs> okay? You start seeing that kind of behavior with people, coupled maybe with some weight shifting, and, and you start, we call it being bowed up. In law enforcement, somebody's bowing up. This generally means I'm fixing to become violent. Um, they may, you know, when we talk about target glance, it may be I intend to hit him and I'll just glance over him like, I'm looking at you, but I, uh, I'm going to get him any minute. Or they do something distracting over here while this one's, you know, that's, those are all those physical signs or things where you need to disengage from that person and say, you know, I think I know the person who can solve your problem. Let me go and get that individual. You wait right here, and I will go and get the person. And then you call 911 and say, you're the person who can fix this problem for me. <laughs> okay. Um, anytime you feel in danger, please disengage from the person. Get out of that environment. Call us. Tell us as much as you can about the person and why you're concerned and what's happening. We're going to ask you a thousand questions. That doesn't mean that help isn't already on the way. I don't know if any of you have ever called 911. Uh, I've been on all sides of 911. I've been the 911 dispatcher that received the call and sent the help. I've been the officer responding to the 911 calls, and I've been the citizen on the other end making a 911 call. And it seems like a thousand questions. Why don't you just send me an ambulance? Why don't you just send me a policeman? Why don't you? There's a reason why we're asking a lot of questions. The more information we have, the better job we can do sending you the help you need. Because I really need to know if I need to send you two policemen or if I need to send you 20. That's, that's a big deal. I gotta know what the problem is. I, I gotta know who you need, how many you need, what's going on, what we may be walking into so we can be prepared for it. But don't hesitate to call because that's, that's why we're here. But definitely when you start seeing these kind of behaviors, it's time to disengage. In your work area, there's nothing wrong with having a code word, which means I, this, this is a problem and I, I need the police, I need help. Um, there are a lot of different code words that they use in different, in different areas. You know, I've, I've, I've got one that, you know, they'll say, can you cancel my next appointment with so-and-so? And it's a specific name that lets them know there's a problem in that office and I need to call the police. Um, you know, there's, there's any number of, of code words or signals that you could use for your coworkers to, when you, especially if you find yourself in that position where they're between you and the door in your office and you don't feel like you can get out. Let me, let me call, let me, you, obviously we need more time. Let me call and cancel my next appointment so that when you, you call and say, you know, can you call Dr. So-and-so, he's my next appointment, and let him know that um, I've, I've got something happening that I really need to take care of that's, that's very important. Whatever it is that you, that you decide on in your, in your area, there's nothing wrong. Have that code word that lets you know we need to be called. And then you, especially if you know you're going to be meeting with somebody that has the, that potential, because sometimes we deal with people repeatedly, and some days they can be okay, and some days they're, they're not having a good day. Nothing wrong with saying ahead of time, hey, you know, I'm, you know, this person coming in my office, you know, can you sit in with me? And then if we call you and say so-and-so, it's time to call the police, time to get us some help. There's a lot of things that you can do to prepare and think about it ahead of time. Planning before the hostile customer or before the person acting out comes is really critically important. It's something we do in law enforcement all the time. You know, if I get a call that there's a, somebody who's stealing a bicycle at a bicycle rack, 
a lot of things are going through my mind. I'm, I'm playing scenarios the whole way there. I'm thinking about, okay, they say he's right here. I'm gonna come in from this direction. I know that other officers are coming in from that direction. Here's what I'm gonna do. Here's where I'm gonna position myself. If he does this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna react this way. If he does that, I'm gonna react that way. And that's, that's what we do constantly. We train that way, we think that way. So there's, there's, it's a really good idea as a work unit to, to look at it ahead of time and say, how are we gonna handle it if this happens? What are we gonna do? And start thinking in terms of you know, where, where the place is that you would meet with somebody that you wanna kinda remove from the general area, what the code word would be if you need help, um, how is this gonna happen, how are we gonna to make things uh, safer for everybody? Because when it's actually happening, it's a lot harder to think in those terms because a lot of adrenaline starts to, to, to dump into your brain and that makes it a lot harder to have higher mental functions working for you. A lot of things happen. Um, when you're in a, in a stressful situation, there are a lot of things physiologically that take place, psychologically that take place. Uh, one of the things is if you're if you get into a fight or flight situation, you'll find that all of your fine motor skills abandon you. If you've ever actually had to call 911 for something and you were really upset about it, I can tell you that I had to, I had to hang up once because I misdialed 911. You know, you gotta work at it. But when your fine motor skills are not doing what you need them to do, it's hard to dial 911. It's hard to do those little things that you do every day and don't think anything about because one of the first things you lose is the fine motor skills. So you gotta, you gotta think in terms, if you've planned ahead, it's a lot easier. Makes it a lot easier. But those are some things to think about. And of course, when in doubt, 911. We're always there. We're gonna ask you a lot of questions. That's okay. Even when they're asking you questions, it doesn't mean we haven't sent help already. We use computer-aided dispatch. So that dispatcher can be typing that call in and sending it to the officer and updating the officer as they're talking to you. Um, they may occasionally say, hold on just a moment when it's something they want to put out by voice to the officer. They're gonna come back and ask more questions. It sounds like a thousand questions. There's good reason for it behind it. We're trying to get you the, the right help as soon as possible and, and to resolve the situation for you. Is it better to call 911 from our office phone or if we're not, we can use our cell phone? You can use your cell phone. An office, any, any landline phone that plugs into a wall is gonna come directly to our 911 call center at the University Police. Your cell phone, there's a better than average chance it's gonna come directly to us. That depends on who your provider is and where the nearest tower is. Uh, the, the system is getting better, and in the, the next generation of 911 that's coming, it's gonna be even more pinpoint as to where the cell phone call originated from. But for right now, if it hits on a tower that's in Temple Terrace, you might get Temple Terrace PD. If it hits on a tower in the county, you may get the county. All you have to do is say, I'm on the USF campus, I'm, I'm in the MHA building, and right there, they're probably gonna stop you and transfer you right to us, because they can transfer you right to us. Uh, if not, they'll take down the information and call us directly in another way. Um, but either way works, either way works fine. Um, even for if you get the question from students who may have a cell phone that is from a different area code, say it's New York area code. Um, the system is smart enough to know that if, if, if the 911 call is hitting off of an 813 tower, that you probably want help from 813 from an agency here. You me wrong, NYPD is great. They'll come. They'll come. It's gonna take them a while on 95 to get here, you know. Um, but yeah, it works. Whether it's a landline phone or, or a cell phone, it works fine. Um, I've, we've had uh, situations where, where people have, have called 911, it went to the county, banged right over to us and there was, there was virtually no, uh, no delay in, in getting that through. But the system is, is pretty smart. It's getting smarter. Um, the technology is, is, 
of 911 is catching up uh, with the, the technology of the cell phone. Yeah, it's, uh, it's getting a lot better. It's getting a lot better in terms of it's, it's, it's starting to recognize those things um, as far as uh, where you're located. And there are quite a few towers on campus at this point. Um, some of them actually moved onto campus when the old Fontana Hall was, was torn down. Um, so several of them now are providers are actually on campus with towers, temporary towers. So um, that'll work just fine. Any other questions? If you've got it, if you're working in an office environment and you, you want to set up your office, again, if possible, where you're closer to the door, than, than the other individual. Go back and, and look at your workspace in terms of what's available to people that could be used as a weapon if somebody becomes upset when they're in your, in your office. Uh, look at your, um, if you have a reception area or an area where people initially go um, to, to make contact with your department and there's a way that you can um, make the transition clearer to people so that they don't just walk into a private, essentially a private area. I know we're a public institution, we're public servants and all that, but in terms of access, there are areas that are restricted and, and private, and then there's the semi-private area, and then there's completely public areas of the university where people are allowed to come and, and walk in to be received, to receive services. So, you know, look at those areas. Um, think about what your plan would be, what to do, how, you, how you're going to react, code words that you can use, um, things you can remove from the environment, things that you can move in the environment so that you still have access to them because you need them for your, for your work, but are maybe not in a place where somebody who is irate could use them as a weapon against you. Other questions? Yes. 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 Sir. If, if uh, do we have to call nine and one or two? Can we talk to the police station directly? Or still call nine and one. I mean, we have the number for the speed dial. So. It, it depends on the situation. You can you can call our business number, our two six two eight number, and it's it comes into the same place. But what's going to happen is if nine one one is also ringing, and the business line is ringing. We're going, to let, we're going to let the business line continue to ring and we're going to answer 911. So to get the highest priority attention in, an emer in a true emergency, police, fire, medical, whatever it is, 911 is the preferred number for you to call simply because that's going to get our primary attention. If the business line is ringing and 911 is ringing, we're going to answer 911 first. So, um, yeah. And I have a question, probably more for Stepfather than for you, but there's been a history in the past, and this may have been overturned, and that we have always been instructed to call our security and not call 911. Is that still the case? Or? No, that's mm -hmm. not the okay. case. Because it used to be that way, correct? Am I it, it used to be, and that was because these guys used, we used to have a, a full security department here. Yeah. And so we kind of inherited the name and the role, but I think more and more with, you know, liability issues and whatnot, it's probably safer to call 911 for a true emergency. Yes, yeah, for a, for a true so emergency. Yeah. 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 First. yeah. I mean, if someone else in the office could yeah. call them while yeah. someone else is on 911, that's fine, but, you know, they're not police officers yeah. and they're not yeah, they, they or expected to do any of those. Yeah, they, they, they don't have the, the same tools, right. training experience that, that we have to respond to us. So 911 is, is a great tool, and that's the primary tool that, in a true emergency that, that you need to, to utilize. Um, I think we say call them in conjunction with 911 because our building is so large and the area is so confusing that it's just it get an unfamiliar officer. We can, if we spot them and kind of flash yeah. them and take them yeah. straight to the problem. Yeah, I, I've been here a long time and there are still areas where I, I get turned around in, in, this, in this area because it is a maze. It is. Um, so, yeah, that's fine. But 911 is, is the primary number that you want. In fact, I have magnets, <laughs> little police car magnets uh, for you guys to uh, 
put in your, your work area so you know how to call us. Um, other questions, concerns? We tend to see a large number of patients that walk out of university community for whatever reason. And our entrance is right across from the emergency You're so theory. convenient to them. It, and sometimes we, it's hard to determine what they want. And it's even harder because at the area where they walk into, you get, we have you know, work study students there who just, they panic. Yeah. And these folks walk in. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes all they want is a phone or they don't want to go back to the hospital. Yeah. But how do we handle, I mean, is that something where you try to talk to them or should we, for, for people that obviously, you know, walked out of an institution, whether or not it was with doctor, you know, doctor's consent, is that something we call you guys first or should yeah. we try to help? It, it depends on the situation. I mean, I, I, I would say if this person obviously, you know, looks like they were probably released from the hospital and just don't have a way home and they need yeah. a phone, yeah. that's one thing. If somebody's got an IV bag hanging out of them, <laughs> stuff, you know, flapping yeah. from the, you know, the gown, it's probably time to, to call us and make sure that they were supposed to go when they did. I saw one at the bus stop. No kidding, like a couple of days ago in the afternoon when I thought we were going to die standing up there gown? in a hospital gown with an IV bag. At the, oh bus, my at the bus stop across on the yeah. other side of yeah. Fletcher. But. Yeah, generally they want to remove that IV before you leave the hospital, so if they've still got that in, it's a pretty good indicator they, they didn't want them to go quite yet. Um, you know, people can, can leave against medical advice. Uh, you know, I've seen people do it, even people I know ready to pull their own IV out because they're, again, frustrated with the process because, uh, you know, once the doctor tells you you can go home, um, you can be eight to ten hours waiting for somebody to fill out the paper that says you can go home. And believe me, it's been there, done that, and got several t-shirts uh, from it. Um, people sometimes get upset. Um, we just saw it, if you watch the news, uh, just in the last few days, the lady got tired of waiting for her test results at Tampa General and walked out and she was tuberculosis positive. And a couple of days law enforcement was looking for her to try to get her the help she needed before she you know, exposed additional people. And they finally uh, located her, I think, yesterday. But um, sometimes f folks are, are out and about from the hospital and uh, the danger they pose is un you know, unknown to them uh, because there's, there's something else going on. So definitely, uh, you know, if you have any question, you can call us and we'll, we'll try to get with the hospital and verify whether this person, um, you know, there's any reason that they couldn't just walk away. You can walk away from a hospital in, in most, most situations. You can, you can leave against medical advice and uh, they're just, uh, usually they want you to sign a form that says I'm not going to sue you because I left against medical advice. Um, but definitely if, if you see an IV bag hanging, uh, they're walking down with it. Uh, that's probably a good call to make to us to say, Would, could you please come and make sure this person is okay? Uh, so if we call 911 because this is a, you know, confusing side of the campus and we say, we want to know where we're at. We just give you the building, or do we need to? This is a big building. How, how they'll ask questions. Yeah, about building room number. Um, they may ask for additional. And if you know that you're in a very complicated part of the facility, most of us know, like this building. You know, if you said West Side A, I, I would come right to West Side A. I I know where it was. But if you're really in the in the middle of the maze. Uh -huh. Sometimes the building code and what we call it are two different things. Yeah, and you can give them both of those. Mm -hmm. There was a 911 call from the MHF building, and the person on the phone thought they were in a certain Social building work, and yeah. called it a certain thing, but the um, dispatcher obviously thought it was something else, so there was confusion about it. Yeah, it's part. okay to say I'm in MHA, which you may know as the West Side, West yeah. Side A conference area. 
it, it's okay to, to tell us a couple, because uh, for one thing, it depends on how long people have been, if you've been here as long as I have. Sure. I have two or three different names in my head for a lot of places on campus where they've changed over the years. Um, a couple of years ago, they put numbers on the building like they were going to be identified with a street. Yeah, Not yeah. That I know that number. And that, and that number is for 911 purposes because everything needed a 911 address and there's a whole complicated, convoluted story behind all of that. But um, for mail purposes, the university, of course, still uses the 4202 Fowler and a mail point. Each building does get a physical address. So if you know what the physical address is and want to give that to us too, that's great. You can give us two or three different locators like that and it'll, it'll help us find you. Um, if, if an ambulance is needed and we call 911, you guys arrange for the ambulance? Yes, what we'll do is transfer the 911 call. We'll, we'll get the information about where it is and what's going on. Uh, there was one going on even as I came today. Mm -hmm. We were responding to a medical call. Uh, they'll get the inf basic information from you and then our dispatcher will transfer you to Tampa Fire Rescue who provides our uh, ambulance services. Um, and they'll determine what, what, do you get an ALS, a BLS, and there's again a whole alphabet soup involved there. Um, but they'll, they'll decide what and then what we'll do is we'll send an officer to the location where the medical emergency is and if, if it's in an area that's difficult to find, another officer will escort the fire truck or the engine mm -hmm. into the, to the actual area, and those officers will coordinate, and where are you actually in MHF? Right. Where are you really? <laughs> Which door do I come in? And they'll, and they'll get together and, and coordinate those things. But uh, it's a process, because it can be very confusing. This is the city within the city. And, uh, it's, it's, it's a challenge sometimes for folks from the outside who, who aren't as close as we are to realize that it's not like a high school where, you know, do you go to building A or B? You know, those are your choices. Well, we got 300 different structures on campus mm -hmm. that somebody could be going to in 52 parking lots and four, five, six garages, how many are it is now. So it's, it's you, you do need to give some specific locators uh, that'll, that'll help us find it, but we'll, you know, we're pretty familiar with where everything is, which is the big advantage to having us mm -hmm. responding for you is that we've got a, a pretty good idea where you are even in a complex area like this one. I'm wondering though for other purposes, for ambulance or fire trucks, if we should find out what our 911 address. address is so that we can let people know what it is in case they need to give it for some reason. Yeah, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't hurt. You can do it. For the most part, the university still uses the geo code and, you know, MHA-126. That's what the university mostly uses. Um, and I'll be honest with you, if I'm calling 911, yeah. I'm not going to remember. <laughs> right. That, well, yeah, like, like, like do you want to add a, a layer of confusion? So. But I mean, we can talk about it. Yeah, but if you tell us the geocode, once we, our system works, it, it should populate with the street address. Okay. It should, okay. it, it should so you know all that. So you forward that then to the... Yeah, well, we'll, we'll, we'll let the ambulance know. A lot of times we'll, we meet them at uh, a particular intersection. For you guys, we'd probably meet them at Bruce B. Downs and Holly and, and bring them in that way. So we'll, we'll tell them a specific entrance or coordinate with them what entrance they're coming in and then escort them to the correct building because we know where they all are. Okay. On a different note, um, if a call comes in, a threatening call, like say a bomb threat or something like that, how, how should that be handled? Uh, if you're, there's something called the malicious call trace, which is, uh, if you can read about that uh, at IT online, and there's, there's a way that you can, uh, uh, there's something that you push after you hang up, there's, there's, a, there's a code, and then use another phone to call us over, and that'll help us retrieve that information as to where the call was generated from. Um, if it's a bomb threat, there's a, there's a bomb threat checklist that an officer will, have, will go through with you and have you fill out. Um, 
and then we'll we'll take it from there coordinating with the building supervisor as to given the information we have do we evacuate the building do we not evacuate uh, conduct a search and, and and just take the investigation from there uh, but there's there's a series of questions on that bomb threat checklist that we're going to start asking you so it doesn't hurt if the person's still on the line with you to okay where is the device what kind of device is it when is it going to go off why did you plan it why did you do this you know you can ask a series of questions we're going to try to ask you to identify is there a particular accent that that person spoke with do they sound like they're from new york do they sound like they're from alabama do they sound like you know did you hear something in the background you know what what anything that you can tell just from what you heard from the person specific words that they used phrases anything like that we're going to is going to be part of the questionnaire that we'll have whoever received the call fill out um, but definitely call us right away and uh, let us get started on it since the advent of caller id we don't get as many of those as what we did in years past but we do still get them and uh, it's still a serious crime, and when you're threatening to, to place a weapon of mass destruction, um, that's something that's taken very seriously. People think they're maybe, you know, committing a prank, and they're committing a crime, and they need to, because it disrupts our ability to function as a university. Minimally, it does that. As well as scaring people, which is a bad thing, too. No. Going back to hostile customers, let's say, despite our best efforts to de-escalate or disengage, it devolves to physical altercation. What are the, the ramifications as far as the person defending themselves? Can the, the person who initiate, and I understand, you know, and the reason I ask is because of the, the, the trial in the news and the rules of self-defense, but how does that, because I know some of those rules are a little bit different on campus as they, than they are. Well, obviously you can't have weapons, Correct. you know, yeah. are not permitted on campus, so that, that is not part of the equation. Yeah. Um, you, you can defend yourself, protect yourself. Um, we, don't, we don't recommend that anybody try to, you know, if somebody's becoming violent, don't initiate Certainly. laying hands on that individual. But if they certainly attack you, you can defend yourself, protect yourself. Um, it, and I'm not an attorney, so I will not give you legal advice. Um, but what I will say is, generally, what's looked at is, the, if anybody's ever taken criminology classes, a reasonable man theory, if you, what you did was reasonable, and, and a reasonable individual would find your reaction to that threat reasonable, be able to articulate why you did what you did. It generally has to be you have no alternative. You know, this person attacked me. You know, I didn't, I didn't initiate anything. Uh, and again, I'm not an attorney, so I'm not giving, I'm not giving legal advice. <laughs> to those of you in Cyberland who are listening later, I'm not giving legal advice. But be able to articulate why you did what you did and, and why that was the, the, the alternative that you had, okay, and why you were in fear and those kind of things. Um, hopefully, you will either disen have disengaged from that individual and gone to a, a safe area to call 911 before that happens. Um, and we won't, we won't get to that to that point. The idea is you don't, you don't have to, to, to you know, continue to deal with somebody who's being hostile and who's being difficult and you know, you, once you begin to be in, in fear, you, know, you can say, hold on a second, I, I, think, I think there's somebody better able to help you with this and get us involved. As, as I said earlier, a lot of times when we walk in the door, that's going to be enough to de-escalate somebody because they realize, uh-oh, this, this person has some options coming in. And we do have a lot more options than, than what the typical employee is going to have. Um, 
and some training to take care of it. So hopefully we will not get to that point. Um, but you know, if we do, articulate why you did what you did. Anything else?